introduction when we talk about malware and things like that, we gotta have the obligatory Sun Tzu quote, so I have this here. <laughs> um, but why I always quote Sun Tzu, you know? I mean, there's perfectly other great philosophers or military intelligence officers out there, so why do we always quote Sun Tzu? I don't know, we could quote Nietzsche or Machiavelli or Jesus Christ or pick anybody. So I just thought, well, I'll just pick Patton. He was a general in World War II. This quote sounded kind of cool, so I went ahead and just selected this one because it kind of uh, can apply in the world of cyber. <coughs> so anyway, <coughs> I work a lot in computer network defense, which is trying to find the bad stuff happening as it happens. Uh, it's a very difficult and very losing battle, so I don't know what that tells you about me. I like to do things that I could never <laughs> achieve or attain. <laughs> Just keep on to like trying to plug away. So I thought I'd just go through a brief introduction about what I do and the world I come from to set the framework and the context. So I kind of created this slide to talk about how this all works. We have indicators, whether they be antivirus signatures or intrusion detection signatures or whatever you have, log files from your system. And those are indicators, and based on those indicators, hopefully there's a framework for you to provide these indicators up to analysis, and then you can detect on them. You have alerts from these particular systems. And then we have to determine whether or not these alerts really mean anything to us, so we have to validate the alert. Is it really, really something bad's happening, or something bad is, or something that is happening that looks bad that just triggered uh, the antivirus or the intrusion detection system? So that's the validation. And if it is a true uh, event, uh, security event, then we want to do a collection. We collect all the evidence, we collect the network traffic, we collect possibly stuff off the host, and we grab hard drives, and when they ship it off to other people who can go through all that. And we grab more and more stuff, which ultimately turns into intelligence. And hopefully, that gets fed back into your process for indicators and finding more bad stuff. <coughs> Um, how well this works in various organizations, um, some are quite mature and, and some are not so mature. And um, how it works amongst other agencies as far as sharing indicators, um, sometimes that works rather well and sometimes it doesn't. <clears throat> so anyway, here's the vectors. Um, any attack that is going to happen is going to usually have to go through one of these vectors. So um, monitoring on these particular ports and protocols is highly recommended and um, triggering off alerts based on activity coming through these ports um, is very beneficial. And I obviously switched down their physical because that's a vector as well, but <clears throat> that's a little bit different to detect rather than um, dealing in cybersecurity. So, um, when we talk about targeted attack trends, uh, these are some of the general generalities that, that exist. So um, this one we're going to look at uses uh, ActiveX um, to, it's a function within Windows that Windows wanting to gain more developers to their operating system and their products, they opened up all these things and they created all these technologies and now we have this wonderful world where there's a lot of things within Windows that, that can happen that are just like, why, why is it like this? And this is one technology. Um, there's multiple file formats that are used in these targeted attacks. Um, and they usually come in uh, through email or they'll have multiple layers um, of obfuscation that we'll go through and I'll show you um, that come into the organization. Um, these are some more trends. And these are, again, general. These are very generalized. Um, email is usually the number one vector. I say that because we've seen some instances where it's not. <clears throat> um, it's almost always going to use DNS, so monitoring DNS logs and network traffic is very important. Uh, we've seen a lot of reuse of shell code. You know, why, why write code that's already been written when you can just use it again if it was successful before? Just use the same code, and off you go. Again, um, and then zero day exploits. Pretty much any time you're going to see uh, mention of a zero-day exploit, you can usually automatically think that there's some entity behind it with a lot of money and a lot of resources to plan and execute this particular attack, um, just based on the fact that they're using something that hasn't been found before and it's been packaged up and has done a lot of work um, to target the particular organization. 
Okay, so this particular sample um, is from 2011. I know it's kind of old in the world of cyber, but I'll show you a more recent example as we have some time. Um, it's an Excel document, and this is the MD5 hash of the document. This document is freely available online, um, and it's also on the CD that I put there. So <clears throat> what I'm gonna do here is kind of go through the methodology that I went through, because this was really interesting to me. I work like I said, in computer network defense, so I'm not really a reverse engineer, but I am interested in that, and so I wanted to go through the document and try and figure out how this worked and, and why it worked. And so I won't, take you how long, I won't tell you how long it took me to do that, but um, <laughs> nonetheless, I got to a point where I was able to uh, get through the whole thing and, and feel a sense of gratification that I was able to do that. Um, it takes, the learning curve is relatively flat for a long period of time, and there's a little uptick as you keep on banging your head against the thing, as I'm sure most of you have done with various projects. So anyway, the first thing we're gonna do is look at some static file attributes. So we have the file, and we're just gonna use some simple Linux commands, or Unix commands, um, to get some attributes from the file. So. We're gonna look at file magic, uh, which reads headers of the files and pulls out, extracts information. We're gonna look at hex dump, which shows the, uh, as the binary representation as it is. And then we're gonna look at some strings with some various options. Uh, strings just look at ASCII characters or various other formats of characters in the file. So let me switch over to the uh, lab. The password for the lab is lab. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up a uh, shell. Make it so you can see it. And once you log in here, it's gonna be in a directory called work. I put everything in there. So I'm gonna CD into work. And here's my file. And so I have notes here too, so you can go through the notes. So if I just look at the notes, here's the static attributes that we're gonna look at the file. So the first thing we can do is run file, which is gonna read in the, mag the file magic and attributes of the file. And there's some interesting things that we'll take note of here. <clears throat> so it says it's a Microsoft Office document. Um, the things that I want you to notice, I don't know if you can see this, so let me uh, do this again. The things I want you to notice there is the code page that's used and um, the last time saved and date. Uh, the last saved time and date is there at the end, Monday, January 17th, 2011, and the code page that's used. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is just take a look at the file. So we're gonna look at this on disk like so. Oh wait, before I do that, let me do this. Pull in my notes. We'll look at various uh, aspects of the file with strings. So this one will show 16-bit um, big Indian. So it's gonna swap the bits around and then look for strings in the file. So, uh, and I'm gonna pipe it to less so that it'll page through um, as we go. So the first thing we're gonna look at here is just any indicators that we can see. And up here we see a particular um, uh, what appears to be a shockwave flash file in an Excel document, because we all need to have flash running in our Microsoft documents, right? <clears throat> so um, we page down, there's not much else to see here, so we note that, oh, there's the um, flash file in there. So then we can look at it using the uh, little Indian 16-bit, so let me just copy that. And we can see that, oh, this appears to be a Visual Basic application project. Um, some fonts, some other stuff. Um, here's some libraries. Here we see the uh, calls the Shockwave Flash. So we're gonna use those libraries in our document because we all need Flash in our Excel document. <clears throat> and then last, we're gonna look at um, single 8-bit byte character. Ah, if I can copy it right. Let 
Oh, here's we got some hex that's unreadable, but here we find some very interesting stuff. We see a flash file header. Um, we see this is actually um, a compressed shockwave flash file header. And here we see what appears to be some random shell code, much like a sled, no op sled, or something like that. Um, so this looks very odd, uh, just looking at it statically. Mm. So there's not much else to see here. Let's look at the file as it is on disk. Hex dump will show us the output. It will give us our offsets on the left, and then the bytes there on the, in the middle, and then on the right, some ASCII representation of the bytes. So here's our file magic. This is what was read um, when we did file. It looks at the header of each file, and it tells us attributes about the file. So if we page through here, um, here we can see where the flash file begins. FWS is a flash file header. So that's right here. Where is it? Right here. Something like that. And then we see some, some code here that we saw earlier. Uh, look, looks to be some kind of repeating patterns. If you look at the ASCII, there's this FF77, FF77, FF77. So something's going on there. And we can continue to page down, and then here's our break. And then here begins um, the compressed flash file header. So we got a lot of big flash in this Excel document. Really large. But if we continue just to look through it and page through it, um, this is one of the things that I found by looking at it statically. You can look for patterns um, that are easily pretty recognizable to the human eye, but maybe not so much to uh, a computer. So that's the advantage us humans have over computers. Computers are really big calculators and do really well with numbers. Um, humans do really well with seeing patterns and things like that. So anyway, um, here's one of the things that I noticed in the file. <clears throat> um, this is the end of the file. Um, that obviously stands out, right? Wow, it's kind of cool. Um, but does anybody see any else pattern that, uh, that is kind of recognizable in this? This is the end of the file. Uh, system. Uh, system? Yep, there's that there. Um, I'll come back to this, all right? So, let me go back to um, the slides and show you what we found. Code page 936, remember from the file attributes? That's Microsoft's character encoding for simplified Chinese. <clears throat> now, of course, all of these attributes can be modified, right? I mean, if you're a skilled attacker and you know the ins and outs of Microsoft and Windows and all of this, you can pretty much manipulate it however you want um, or not. So, you know, as we're doing analysis and we're looking at this, we could take the two branches, right? Let's just say that the static file attributes are what they are or they could not be. So there's two choices here. So we'll just stick with, let's say, okay, we're just going to assume that there was no modifications done on the file attributes. So in this case, this is one indicator that we can pull from the file attributes. The particular vulnerability that was found um, in this, this zero day was uh, this flash vulnerability. It was um, CVE 2011-0609. And they released a patch um, March 21st. <clears throat> and you can see <laughs> the various other number of patches that they've had throughout the year of 2011 and the numbers on the, on the left. So anyway, when we were looking at the end of the file, does anybody know it's this pattern? <clears throat> There's a, if you look at it long enough, the, the pattern kind of makes itself clear, and I kind of highlighted it and gave it away at the bottom. But there's incrementing X score operation in every other byte. So if you start down there at the very bottom, there's an 02, and then a skip, and then an 04, <coughs> And then 06, skip, 08, skip, 10, skip, 12, skip, 14, all the way through the file. So it's like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. 
<clears throat> and the other thing, oh, so now that we've analyzed our file and we've seen various attributes that probably shouldn't be there, flash files and Excel documents and weird obfuscation, uh, we can begin to start to carve out this stuff and then do some operations on it to see what's, what's going on. So we'll go a little deeper into our analysis and we're going to use some other tools. We're going to use DD, which is going to carve out portions of the file for us. And we're going to use fwdump and flasm, which is um, shockwave flash um, decompilers. So let's go ahead and uh, go back there and do that. <coughs> And this is all in the notes again. So if I look at my notes. So we can uh, look at the offsets to carve out the file. So remember up here we did hex dump. We can take a look at our flash file where the beginning of it is. So if I do that again. And I look for FWS, which is the header to the flash file. I find one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it starts here. Here's my offsets, A18. Because we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then start. So the A010 marks the 66, but we want to start carving at the 46, which is after eight bytes. So we use our calculator. We type in A118 into our hex, hexadecimal calculator, and that gives us 2584 bytes. So we need that because um, that's what DD needs to count the blocks or the number of bits to where to start and then where to carve. So we're going to use DD here to carve out our file. And what it is, is I'm just taking an input file, and that's my document, and I'm going to put an output file. I'm going to call it just flash, flash. I'm going to use a block size of 1, and then I'm going to skip 2580 bytes, and then start carving. So if I do this now, I have this FWS file here. If I do file, FWS, tells me it's a micromedia flash file, which is good. Now I can operate on it. And I have in my notes, now let's take a look at um, what SWF says about it. Uh, so we get some stuff spill into the screen. <laughs> Interesting enough, I have a segmentation fault. My core dumps, hmm, that's probably by design. And uh, I put all the output here. So I'm dumping, oops, yes, I know. So FW dump is going to dump everything from this file. And then I'm going to redirect the output to this file. However, some stuff spills on the screen. So let's take a look at this. This is really cool because it gives you a lot of attributes about the file. <clears throat> um, it tells me the uh, actual size of the file. Um, and then if you're really into debugging and decoding, <laughs> Flash, you can look through all this, but what we're really interested in is just looking for something that pops out. You can see references to um, byte arrays. And here we go. Push string. There's our what appears to be shell code again. And you can see here, it's going to turn it from hex to binary, write it out somewhere, and then it'll probably execute, but we don't know yet. Here's another string. This one is the large file that has um, uh, the other compressed shockwave flash file. So let me take a look at this. So we want to get out the uh, second file, right? The compressed shockwave flash file. And we, we saw that with our strings command. So what we can do here is take our strings command. 
And that gives us our flash file in ASCII. And what that did, based on the strings output that we did before, I took the 26th line, which is the line that showed that, and then I just want to copy that one line or spill it out to the screen, so I just do a head at line 26 and then tail, and it's just going to show me that line, which is a long line. So what I do with that um, here, I would redirect this file to um, something that I could operate on it. So what I did already is I copied it into this PHP file, which allows me to take the strings, that bunch of uh, hexadecimal characters, and I'm going to turn it into a binary file. I'm going to use this with the pack function, and I'm going to um, use hex just to convert this string into a binary file. Oops. And then I'm going to end it here and just write it out to the screen. So I'm going to run PHP on the file, and then I'm going to call it file CWS. And if I do, if I look at it now, I get the function that was called from the flash file. So I need to take that out, but I have the uh, compressed shockwave flash file header here, 435753. So what I can do with this is I'm going to edit the file. I'm going to take out that string, and then I'm going to operate on the file. So I have a couple of utilities on here. I have a GUI tool that we'll use a little bit later. I also have a command line tool, um, which I'll use here, binary vi which allows me to um, edit binary files. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move this string option, so taking out the characters, and then I'll leave that header at the beginning of the file. And then I'm going to write that file down. And now if I do file, CWS, oops, file. It tells me that it's a macromedia data compressed file. And the next thing I'm going to do is operate on that file. Here we converted it. And then we took out, I used uh, BVI, which is a command line tool. Bless we'll use a little bit later, which is a GUI tool, to take out that. And now I'm going to decompress it <coughs> with Flasm. So Flasm will decompress, um, oh wait, what was it? Flasm will decompress compressed shockwave flash files. Oops. So I have it decompressed now. It creates a file here. Uh, so it says file dollar SWF. So if I do file, file. It tells me it's a macromedia flash file. And if I operate on this file with SWF dump now, because it's, it's uncompressed, I get um, some more problems. So what we have here is we have our Excel document. It's got two flash files in it. One is like a big flash file that contains another flash file. The first flash file, or the first envelope, contains what appears to be shell code with another file, another big compressed file. And what's happening here is, as you can see at the bottom, if you can see that, I get a core dump again, segmentation fault, and I get a bunch of uh, mismatched opcodes, which means that flash can't interpret what's going on here. And so it's from this compressed flash file that the vulnerability is, is um, leveraged against the flash player. And then the other flash file contains the shell code, which is going to be used to execute once the vulnerability is taken advantage of in the file. So now let's look at the shell code. If I look at my 
notes. We're going to use another tool to work with the shell code. <clears throat> so let's get um, strings from, from the file again. So here's what our, appears to be our shell code. So I'm going to double click this, which copies this file. And then I have a utility called shellcode to exe. And what that's going to do is that's just going to put this particular piece of shellcode into like a binary um, Windows executable file. This is a tool that was developed a number of years ago from iDefense. And all I can do is just push put the shell code in here, and then I click Submit. And what's going to happen is it's going to wrap this shell code into an executable, and then I can start to debug it. So once I submit this, it's going to say it's going to save it as shellcode.exe. So I'm going to save that. And now in my tools here, in the out directory, I have Ollie debug. So I'm going to cd into out. I'm going to copy this shell code that I just downloaded. And I'm going to run my Windows emulator, and I'm going to run Ollie Debug. And we're going to start to step through the shell code to see what it's doing. So here's my shell code, and I open it up. And now I'm in my debugger. So Ollie Debug is not intuitive at all, <laughs> if you've ever worked with it. <laughs> but it's pretty powerful once you figure out what it's doing and how it works. Um, like I said, I'm no like reverse engineer, but I'm interested in it. So I want to figure out how stuff works. So these various windows, they have the ASCII representation, or like a hex dump down there in the lower left-hand window. If we were to hex dump the file, we'd see this. Um, we have the stack, um, which is just a slot of memory here that, that's going to do the operations and throw stuff down. Then we have our registers. And what helps me when I do this is like a computer, all it is is like a big calculator, right, that can hold stuff and do operations and things like that. And so the registers are various placeholders on the calculator that you can throw stuff into and then do operations on. And then uh, in our window up at the top, we can see what's actually going on. <clears throat> so what's, what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and step through this and see what the shell code is doing. Because the author of the shell code is, I mean, just to look and see what they do, it's kind of awe-inspiring in a way. Like, like people really know how to do this, and they can do it really well, and they can do it very, in a relatively short number of bytes. <clears throat> um, so we'll step through that and, and kind of go through it. So what we're seeing here in this first part is just what's, what's from shellcode to exe. So it includes this particular portion, these four lines up at the top, and then it includes a series of no ops. And so right after the no ops is when your shellcode begins. So F8 will step through each command. And so that's what I'm going to press here as we go. And you can see over on the... When the registers change, it's doing operations on all these instructions, and, and the registers will change on the right-hand side. Um, so here's the beginning of our shell code, right? It had a number, a series of 14s. And then here we find um, this particular structure defines a process environment block, which is a structure within Windows that says, hey, this is kind of some code that we're going to do to execute. So we come through here. We need to use NTDLL because that's the base by, uh, library on Windows to do everything from. So we need to load that in. And I'm going to step through. We also need kernel32.dll because we need that to load a number of library calls or API calls that we're going to need our shellcode to take advantage of. Um, so then, uh, whoops, here I am. So then I come to a jump. And I'm going to follow that jump, and I get a call, which is a call to a function. 
And then I'm going to follow that. And when I press F8, it just runs. It's like, I'm done. Shellcode already executed. I'm like, damn it. So you're going to have to do this multiple times as you go through all debug because the shellcode will do certain things that you don't expect it to do. And so you'll have to kind of step through it and set breakpoints and all this other stuff. So what's happening here, I'll show you if I'm going to restart this. I go back to the beginning, reload it. I'm going to do F8 all the way down. NTDLL kernel 32. Here's my jump. So it's going to go jump, call, and then it's going to come back here. So let me set a breakpoint here. Because if I follow this all the way down, you can see it jumps down here. It's going to go all the way to the end. And it's going to come all the way back up to this pop. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here at the beginning of where the call is returning to. So I'm going to press F8. And now I'm at my pop. So shellcode will use this a lot because it needs to find it needs to find its frame of reference in memory. Okay, so once the shellcode is alive from this vulnerability, the vulnerability is going to lay down this shellcode. The shellcode's now in memory. It's got to go. Where am I? Where I don't know. Where am I? So it's going to do this little routine. It's going to go jump, call, and then pop. And so now it has its frame of reference. Okay, I started at this address. I went all the way to the end of where I am, and I'm at this address. Now I'm going to go out to the beginning, right one below from where I am. And so now I know where I am, and I have all this to operate on. Now I can go through all the routines that have been set out before me to find out what I need to do. Now um, I'll kind of jump through this a little bit. But what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go into the function that explains this. Um, wh what happens here is I'm going to do F8, 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 F8. So there's this series of calls you can see here. They all look very similar. And they're all at the beginning of my shell code. So if I go back up to the top, come on. We can see them being enumerated as we, as we go through them. There's a function here that I'm not going to step into that actually it kind of encrypts the operation. And so what happens is every time I go into this function, it's going to decrypt this, this thing and then come back to here at these places. So I'll just step through them, and you guys can see what happens in the middle here. It's going to enumerate the API call that it's going to need. So here I'm going to use kernel 32. I'm going to use global allocate. Global allocate is a way to create memory space that I'm going to need. So I'm going to allocate memory. I need a free memory. I'm going to create a file. It's helpful. Close a handle. A handle is just a, something that references a file. I'm going to read a file, right? Because I'm, I'm in an Excel document. And when Excel opens up in Windows, I'm going to say, here I am. And Windows is going to read it and say, wow, it looks like you have Flash in this Excel document. Let me help you out with that. Let me open up Flash for you. So the Flash loads. And from the, the code that's in the Excel document, that gets put into the Flash file or Flash player. Flash player opens up. And I've got this vulnerability in my Flash player. And oh, this code executes. And now I have this code in my Flash player. But the, but the file I want to drop is actually back in the Excel document. So I need to have a handle back to the Excel document from Flash to figure out where I need to drop my payload from. So that's what this is all for. I need to read the file. I need to get the handle. I need to get all this stuff. And I'm going to write a file. This is all really good indicators of bad stuff <laughs> happening. I'm going to delete a file, set my file pointer back to the Excel document. And I need winexec, right? So once I have my code, I need to execute it. Copy the file, exit process, 
get the file size, and delete the file. So I have all these API functions now in my shell code. Because you can't really write all this into shell code because all the libraries are there are existing on Windows. So you write this very small piece of code that's just going to reference all these APIs to do all these other things for you. And that's how a lot of Windows binaries works. OK, so let's go through this. So now I begin my functions. I'm not sure what this function does. Um, it's going to get file size. So I'm in Flash, and I'm, I need to get back to Excel. But how do I know what Excel document? Perhaps they have multiple ones open. So this is just a check to say, I'm going to get my file size that was opened in Excel, and it's a certain size because I, the, show co I, the author, the malicious author, actually know what the size is. So I'm going to look for the size in the get file size. But the problem is, is as I'm debugging it, there's no Excel running on my machine. So I have to tell Ollie Debug, I'm going to be like, you know, you don't really have to worry about that because there's no Excel here. I just want to see what you're going to do. So here are some checks to get the file size. If I do F8, so EAX has just changed to an unsigned negative 1. So I need to change that to get past that. Otherwise, it's going to jump back to the beginning, and I don't want to go back to the beginning. So I'm just going to change this to that. So now it's not going to be negative 1, F, 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 and it'll jump past this particular jump here. So I'll do F8. My jump is not taken, which is good. And then I'm going to move on. Compare EAX to 1,000. So why do we do that? My file size is 1,032. So if I look for a file about that size, that's going to be the right file that I want to get to. But since I have no Excel document open, I can just put it, I can just tell the shell code, this is the file you're looking for. If I go back here, it's going to compare EAX to the file size. And I'm going to say, sure. You're looking for 10,000. I'm going to give you 10,001. Now, if I go here, my jump is not taken. So the shell code thinks, oh, I've got my file handle. I've got my Excel document. I got the right one. Now we can move on. So let's move on. Now I need to allocate some memory, right? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a space to do some stuff. So these are just some parameters that are passed into that. Now I need to get a file pointer, right? So I'm a reference back to the Excel document. Now that I got the right one, now I'm going to put a pointer to that file because I'm going to need to do some operations on it. Oops. Oh, just hit the wrong button. OK. And as you debug, you have to start over and over and over as you make mistakes. Mm. Here's my jump call pop. Here's my enumeration of all the codes that I'm going to need, API calls. File size. Compare.
Okay. Now, I've gotten to a certain portion in my shell code. Now I need to read the file, right? I've got the right Excel document, I set my pointer to it, now I'm gonna read the file. And here's some interesting stuff. There's a shellcode structure that has been used at least a year earlier to define where the payload is in the document. So if you can see this top section here, it's gonna look for this particular um, address in memory and it has to be with this value as well. So it's just gonna loop through the document and look for these two um, addresses in memory. And then once it finds those, this is gonna be the file header. And then once it finds those, it's gonna move on and go and find the file footer. So we're in the Excel document, I need to find where I need to start carving and when I need to stop carving. And we can see that in the document Oops. Just past all this flash. Well, I'm not remembering exactly where it is, so. We'll start with the footer. So here we have one address of the footer and then the other address of the footer, right? So these is little Indian, so you have to read from left to right. So we have 19820424, 4B635546. So here we have 4B635546, and we have 19820424. All right. And then the header of the file. One nine eight nine. 0604 and 4742243. 19890604 4742243. So here's the code to find the offsets to the file. I don't have time to go into the debugging here, but I want to show you a couple of other things in the file. Once we get the file, It's going to write it out to disk, but before it does that, it's going to write a header to the file. The header is the Windows executable header. Before it writes down this file, it's going to slap this header on, write it to disk, and then execute the file. So let me get back to the presentation really quick. We did the shellcode to XC, and we did Ollie debug. We have our shellcode structure to show um, where the file begins and where the file ends. And if you'll note that these two offsets can be dates or can be read as dates. Maybe, maybe not. Here's the header. Here's the footer. What happened in 1989 on June 4th in a particular part of the world? Tiananmen Square. So it's interesting that this date is used. Now, <coughs> let's go ahead and go back here. Once we found our offsets to the file, we can carve that out, right? Oops. So here, we can calculate with our offsets, again, using the calculator, to 
to our payload. So let's just carve out the payload. Here's our header. Here's our footer. I just carved it out to the end of the file. And then what we can do is knowing what the algorithm is that we saw earlier, incrementing each byte and then XORing each byte and then skipping one. What I did is I went in and I created some C code. I don't know if you can see this. So a lot of this structure was already found on the internet. I just added um, the things that I wanted to do with it. So we're going to open the file, the payload.bin, and then we're going to write a file, the new file out. Then I'm going to set out an integer that's a byte and an unsigned character that's a hex number. And then I need to find which hex number I need to start with in the file, and I found it to be four. And then I'm going to have another integer that's my count. So I need to count two. The count equals two, the hex number equals four, and now I'm just going to enter this loop that goes through the, the file as it's read and do these operations. So the first one, if the file is, uh, if the count is divided and it equals zero, then I'm going to do the XOR operation, this um, byte XOR hex num. And then I'm going to increment my hex number, or minus the hex number, and then I'm going to increment the counter, which is what the uh, file offset, off, or the shell code does. So I compile this with uh, GCC. I'm just going to call it test. And now I have my payload. And then I'm going to run my file. And I spill out the operation to the screen. And I have my new file. New bin. And if I do, well, if I do hex dump on my payload. Ugh. It looks like garbage. Once I do the operation, it looks a little more readable. This program must be run under Win32, right? And with my header, um, Here's my file. I use it with bless. And I'm going to take out the first four bytes. And I'm going to overwrite the next bytes with the Microsoft Windows header. So in the shell code, in here it's eight, add eight up at the top. And then right here, write the header out. It only has 40. 5A90, however, it's a 32-bit system, so it needs to add the other zero. So if I go back here, I have my 45A90. I need to make this. Ah. Zero, zero. Now if I save this, and I've pretty much run out of time, so I can't um, continue on to show you. But on the CD, on the, the file, or the disk, <clears throat> I 
it has the, um, the references in the links. So what I do is I carve out um, the exact portion of the file, and then it gets to this MD5 hash here, which is the actual payload of the document that was pulled out of the Excel and then executed on the machine. So to quickly finish up, I also included some memory analysis, which will actually dump the payload of poison ivy out of memory, out of um, the Excel document, or out of Internet Explorer. But why does this work? When you install uh, Office and you don't change any of the options, you're going to install Visual Basic for Applications, which is the ActiveX control that's utilized in this particular file, so that you have Excel open and it wants to open up Flash. Thank you, Microsoft. Visual Basic Applications allows you to do that. This is the original email that was sent in the payload. Um, it went to three or four people. And if you'll notice, if you remember back at the beginning, the last time and date saved on the file was January 17th, 2011. And the delivery uh, was March 3rd, 2011, too. So it was in use for about six weeks beforehand. And what I forgot to include in this is that there is um, another reverse engineer did analysis on this particular file. And this particular Twitter account responded to the analysis. So he said, the offset that you were questioning, 1982, or April 24th or whatever, that's the birthday of my friend. So I put that in the shell code. <clears throat> and you can read this particular Twitter account. There's not a lot of posts. But it's very interesting to see that uh, in social media, they're, they're talking about how all this is, is coming about. So anyway, I think I'm totally out of time. So I want to thank you for uh, attending. <laughs>